we're going to be moving on to our next presentation today. I am very excited to have Simon Hughes with us. Um, both Simon and our next speaker, Ellen, are so uh, well tenured um, that I actually have to read their bios because there's too much for me to memorize. I did try. Um, Simon Hughes is currently working as an AI and ML engineer at Vectara. He has a PhD in computer science from DePaul with a concentration in NLP and machine learning. He has over 10 years of experience working as a data scientist and 18 years of experience working within software development. He has worked on multiple search and recommendation engines for companies such as Dice.com and The Home Depot. He is the author of three SIG IR papers published during his time at Home Depot and 11 papers on applying AI for educational purposes and has given many industry talks over the years on semantic search and relevancy tuning. His current research interests include semantic search and retrieval systems and developing the next generation of conversational search engines. So thank you, uh, Simon, for being here. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, so I'm going to give a talk on uh, building an AI-driven search engine um, in the age of deep learning and AI. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, it's a pretty small room. Uh, that's me, not a great picture. All right, uh, what is Vectera? Sean, do you want to? Leave this one for a minute. Okay, I'm blue. I think I'm good. Yeah. Um, so happy to tell you a little bit about Vectara, uh, so you can continue to like Simon. Um, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I've been with Vectara for about six months, and um, when we first started out going to different uh, AI conferences and shows, we would put this picture up that Simon has here. And people would say, oh, that's great. Uh, which one are you? Are you the, uh, you're the extractor, the encoder, the indexer, the retriever, the re-ranker? And what we're starting to find out is that's generally how the market is, is telling people to think about AI, right? Um, and we have you know, marketplaces like Hugging Face, where there's millions of models, everything from retrieval that you can just kind of grab and go. Um, so our approach is a little bit different and a little bit of foundational knowledge uh, founded by uh, you know some of the original uh, the paper writers and, and thesis people from the Google research team um, and, and Google is actually a little bit slow and hesitant strangely enough to to switch over to LLMs and, and kind of conversational search so um, I think they got a little restless and decided to start their own company and, and bring this out there uh, so the answer to the actual question is we're all of this right um, and um, you know really when we see people comparing us to other platforms it is either kind of building it themselves or using this. And so what's the advantage of doing it this way? Uh, we have a lot of internal experience of leveraging LLMs. Our platform doesn't use one LLM, it uses multiple LLMs. And that's where things really become hairy when you try to build this stuff yourself, is, is how do these things talk to each other? How do we manage the, the, the different vector stores and everything associated with it? So generally our customers are people that want to embed generative AI features, conversational first, uh, search directly into their platform. Um, and these are a lot of times these are companies that can do this themselves. They could probably build it themselves with open source components, um, but they decide to go with Vectar because they want to focus more on their core business. Um, and they just connect with us through an API, and they get all that cool, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, language understanding, hybrid search capabilities, um, and really one of our stronger points, which is around uh, retrieval augmented generation. That's really what Simon's going to be talking about today, this idea of grounding responses so we kind of eliminate uh, the impacts of hallucination. Um, and that's really why we exist, to, to tamper the impact of hallucinations so more companies like Google and these other big companies can start actually shifting over to using some of these cool tools. So it's probably longer than a minute. I'm really sorry. There's additional detail with a lot of text on here and happy to answer any questions. But All right. Thanks, Sean. That's better than I could have done. Um, yeah, one of the co-founders created the use model. If you've used that USC model, it's quite popularly known. Home Depot is still using it in production today, not for search, but for other reasons. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we have experience in. Uh, okay, and this is a quick demo, so um, I can actually I think I can go out of here just to, to probably do it live. So we have this Ask News demo. Um, so I don't know, President, I'm not actually sure what the content is in here. Um, let me just run some searches. Uh, so you can just ask questions. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. So let me do uh, why did the government 
shit down. This was indexed a few months ago. It's not, so not all of it's up to date. Um, but one of the advantages of rack system is you can just update it anytime. Uh, so you'll see there's a, not just the search results there, but like with chat, um, uh, with, a, with the Bing chat or, or, or um, Google chat, you know, we can do, we, and we don't just give you results. It'll give you a summary with cited references as to, you know, what the answers are. So we're doing retrieval behind the scenes, and then we're running the results for model and then having it cite the sources there. And I'll get into why that's important in a minute. Um, so that's kind of, and this is, this is a UI that we provide people so they can use this out of the box if they want, or they can build their own kind of APIs. All right, uh, back to slideshow. Okay. All right, so basically giving two, two parts to the talk. First, I'll be talking about sort of generally how you build a search engine, um, not focusing so much on the conversational pieces. And then the second part, I'll be talking a little bit about RAG systems, um, how do you build a conversational search, and then focusing a lot on hallucinations. That's something we've been looking into a lot lately. I'm waiting for time. So, okay. Um, okay, so the, the challenges of building a search uh, engine uh, so as you heard, I've built search for Dice, I've built search for Home Depot, um, and I'm working at Vectara now. Um, so one of the challenges about the search engine is the wide variety of query types. So at Home Depot, we had like color, dimension, skew, quantity, brand queries. In a job site, you'll have all the different job titles, you'll have skills in the jobs, um, you'll have qualifications, schooling, all those different things. So the search engine has to do well across all those different types of queries. And you know, one of the things you want to do is measure the performance in those types of queries to see where your strengths and weaknesses lie. Another, another problem is synonyms or synonymy, where you know, words can be multiple, uh, have multiple different words that have the same meaning, and so you need to be able to handle all of those. Um, the vocabulary mismatch problem is a big issue where people search one way, your documents are, are described in another way. So when the merchants on Home Depot index the documents and write the documents, they, don't, they write it using very formal English people on the site will type in 2x4, and they expect that to match 2x4. That's not how it's listed in a product catalog. So a big part problem with search is just matching those vocabulary, and usually you, you can write a bunch of rules to do that, but it doesn't scale, so that's where you need AI to kind of handle that problem. Um, colloquial terms are a challenge. ID search, so a lot of the vector search engines don't, aren't really well <laughs> designed to search on numbers, so if you type in a product number, uh, you have to have your search engine and, and uh, you know, match that. If you have a job site and you someone paste in an application ID, you have to have something to detect that and, and not hit the regular search term. Um, another challenge is, is the business rules, so handling things like out of stock, um, how old a job is, you know, promoting uh, new content over old content, handling ads. Um, there's a lot of other sort of business uh, constraints that are put on the search engine aside from just relevancy. Um, particularly in the e-commerce space, you know, there's a big push towards getting you know, ad serving these days because Amazon now is, a lot of people don't know, Amazon is one of the biggest ad companies in the world. Um, they're up there with Google in terms of the ad revenue, and that's all from their search and their, the sites on the on website. Um, and so a big part of the search team there and at Home Depot now is how do we get ads onto the site? And how do we charge people for ads? And really, for an e-commerce site, that's really like the charging a higher premium, basically, for those uh, for those results. Um, and yeah, so and, and then other companies' specific logic. So aside from that, you may want to boost your own brands. Um, you may want to offload inventory. So within the relevant results, you know, you may you may want to prefer items that are overstocked. Um, uh, for some, for us, if you're a social media site, you know maybe you want to promote more, more uh, new content or more popular content. You may want to promote new job postings and so on. Um, so search is relevancy, and, and which is a lot of these things, and it's also handling business logic. Um, one of the challenges you'll face with a search engine is the sort of this kind of Zipfian distribution, where a small number of your queries will be responsible for most of your volume. And you have a, a large tail of queries where you maybe see them once a year um, that you need to also be able to make sense of. And where like neural search and machine learning driven search and AI really comes help, helpful is this kind of long tail area. Um, lots of simple techniques. You can generally, if you have enough data in the head and mid, you, you know it's not that hard to solve those problems. It, it's more of a ranking problem there than a relevancy problem. Where relevancy really comes in is in the tail. You know, so, so Home Depot, 
Um, they would have like in the order of billions of unique searches a year in terms of like unique queries, but most of the search volume was in a few hundred thousand queries, most of the sales. But it's really in that tail that we made like the most money, not, not the most money overall, but the most incremental money over just the plain old search. Like most of the head, the simple techniques will work pretty well. Like ridiculously simple, like I won't get into it. <laughs> I get in trouble, but um, like you can do some very simple things that will do pretty well in, in the head. It's really where AI comes in and machine learning comes in is in this tail area. Often those are very long, very specific queries, but not always. They could also be something just very rare, um, or some very usual term. Um, so try to capture sort of the evolution of information retrieval and search over time. Um, before we had like inverted indexes, which is what most of you guys are probably familiar with. We have very basic like textual search, which is really like using regexes and doing Boolean retrieval in databases. Very basic by today's standards. Um, that's kind of where things started off. Some companies are still, still doing that to some extent um, in the database today. Then you had this, what I would call like probabilistic IR because you have things like TFIDF, which is really based on the, it's kind of a relaxation of the probabilistic IR models where you're using like basic corporate statistics about terms and how frequent they are to determine which terms to match over other terms. And then you have BM25 coming on later, which um, is quite old by, by now, but it's still it's basically a statistical way to determine like the more relevant terms in a query. And then you're doing things like stop words and stemming and so on to get more relevant results. So if you're building your own solar engine or your own elastic or open source, you know, often that's where people start is they have an inverted index and they're adding synonyms and stop words and so on. Um, and then machine learning starts to come into the picture. So I would say in the early 2000s in the big, inter, you know, Google, I mean, Google's been around since the late 90s. Um, you start doing things like page rank and other machine learning methods to try to enhance search. And then that starts to propagate later through our industry. Generally, the tech giants lead and then you have startups and the other companies like Home Depot sort of following, and then you have the smaller companies sort of lagging behind there. Um, so Google and Microsoft publishing papers about LTR, learning to rank. Um, in the early 2000s, you have people doing named entity recognition, NER, you know, parsing out um, key keywords from, doc you know, from documents, um, and then sort of doing some semantic matching using like LSA or some of those kind of older techniques, pre-neural. Um, and then around 2010, or I think it was 2012, I was aiming for, uh, Google released something called Hummingbird. I think it was 2012, but I, I don't remember. And that was supposedly the first documented type where they admitted to using some kind of vector search engine, and they used it to handle the tail queries um, first. Google actually didn't use um, learning to rank for a long time. From what they've said, they used a lot of heuristics because they performed better. But they started to get, with the Hummingbird release, they started to get more into a machine learning based search, probably later than people realize. Um, and then, I'm sure there were signals in there, but it was, it was still heuristic driven. Um, and then they started to expand that. So then they released with, with, uh, with VEC, which they didn't come up with. That was based on earlier research. Um, but they, they produced the word to vec um, library, and that, that kind of sped up the kind of semantic matching, and then things sort of took off from there. And now I think, now, nowadays, it's kind of mostly neural, I think. Um, so you move from some machine learning hands to, to neural IR, and then with the advent of now ChatGPT this last year, you've seen quickly the adoption of conversational search in companies like Victara and lots of other startups coming along and trying to also offer similar uh, capabilities, Cohere, um, OpenAI, and so on. <clears throat> and at the bottom here, they're sort of charting the different like systems, uh, like infrastructure, you know, uh, uh, backing those systems. So in the early days, you're looking at Boolean matching, so you're just kind of looking at bit, basically bit, bitwise operations on, on keywords. Then you go to the inverted index, and you're doing something similar, but then you're adding in um, term weightings, and you go to an inverted index versus sort of um, bit, bit matching and so on. And then nowadays, where you have the neural component, maybe you have an inverted index still, but then you're also using vectors and nearest neighbor search, approximate nearest neighbor search um, as the underlying kind of retrieval engine powering the and scaling up the system. Um, I don't have time. <clears throat> um, so the popular, popularity of neural IR has kind of grown uh, over time. Uh, this sort of ends at 2020, but it's still 
kind of going up. So this is like how many papers in um, I think it was SIG-IR, which is the big academic conference on uh, IR, have sort of gone from 1% early 2014 to in the 2020s at 80%, and now it's probably north of 80%. Uh, so kind of quickly, rapidly sort of taken off. And then you'll see sort of the popularity of LLMs and generative AI terms have gone up over time, and then obviously the rapid growth of chat GPT, um, uh, which at the time eclipsed like a lot of the other platforms um, uh, in terms of user growth. So search engines, even going back to the inverted index days, have kind of followed this paradigm which is still, act, still relevant today, which is they first do retrieval and then they do ranking. So even in Elastic or Solar, um, you start off with the retrieval phase. So that, that takes the, term, takes the um, form of Boolean retrieval, where just literally taking the terms and finding all the documents that match those terms, ignoring the weights of the terms or anything else. Um, and often it sort of goes down to like a bitwise operation. And then within an index, and you actually have a re-ranking phase where it's looking at the term weights and term scores and then doing a re-rank of those matched documents. So it's kind of a match and then rank. It's still true to in a different, uh, in the same kind of paradigm in machine learning search. I said it's more complicated. So first of all, you usually have a retrieval model, which is often an, an embedding space model, a vector model that's doing some kind of matching on the vectors, um, <clears throat> that, which then goes to a nearest neighbor search. And that's the retrieval stage. That's usually getting the original match set. Now, it's giving you an initial ranking, but usually companies have a re-ranker that then sits on top of those or takes the top documents and then we sort some based on a more complicated set of criteria or a more complicated model. So this sort of retrieve and then re-rank paradigm has, has been around for a long time and is still pretty prevalent in today's uh, information retrieval systems. And as you'll see a bit later on, we also now add this kind of reading step where at the end you may have an LLM or some kind of language model taking those results and then reading the results and then giving you an actual answer as opposed to just a list of documents. Um, so neural IR, neural information retrieval, is really a, a metric learning algorithm where you're trying to learn a similarity function between a query and a document. Um, this comes up in a lot of machine learning systems, not just uh, search, um, image search, recommendations, um, you're matching image to images, images to captions, any kind of like similarity learning algorithm, they, they follow a similar kind of um, neural network design and it also comes under the term metric learning where learning a similarity function. Um, this is also kind of called embedding-based retrieval, where you, you're learning a vector representation of two things, a query and document, and then maximizing the similarity of those vectors when you do retrieval. Um, so to get uh, information into an all IR system, you still have to do some form of tokenization. That doesn't go away. It's just different. Um, so in uh, Elastic or Lucene, you, you'll probably you have tokenized unigrams, you may do some kind of bigram or trigram matching. Uh, some neural systems and some machine learning systems still do that. Um, one of the systems Home Depot I worked on still does this kind of unigram bigram representation. Here I'm illustrating this idea of character trigrams where you're just passing a three letter window across the terms and getting all of these little character engrams out of it. Um, so en engram tokenization is still around in some neural models and some machine learning models. Uh, the more common approach now is, especially with the transform models, is to do subword tokenization, where you have a learn tokenizer that takes a, uh, a word and they'll break it into a set of uh, tokens based on how common those, those uh, characters are found together. So it will, it will try to combine more common sequences of words into longer tokens, and it uses a compression algorithm uh, to, to do that. So you'll see like longer things like friend. So if you look at unfriendly, it'll break on in unfriend and then Lee because friend is a common subsequence. So it gets a longer, uh, longer token. Um, and that's sort of, it, it, it's designed to sort of optimize data compression. And that seems to work well for these, these kind of models. That originated from machine translation, but then it was moved into sort of LLMs and so on. <clears throat> Um, these kind of tokenization schemes can be good at handling typos, amongst other things. So um, if you type in some like variants of Milwaukee into Home Depot, that's Milwaukee's a brand, you'll see that it matches the Milwaukee grills. Um, simply what they're doing there is they're just doing a subword 
tokens. It's a, the character engram, sorry, not the sub tokens. And then it's just doing a fuzzy match. Because if you take three character matches, even if you have some spelling mistakes, enough of those overlap that it's still, it's still able to handle the error. So you don't actually have to have an explicit spell corrector. You can have the model just kind of do fuzzy matching just using the tokenization scheme. Um, and then, but the normal models, they're also learning semantic representations of the terms. So the subword tokenization can also handle kind of the uh, variance of the typos. So I kind of shortened e cigarettes to e cigs and France to fans, and you'll still see in our Ask News demo, we're getting matches on fence and uh, e-cigarettes there. So that these techniques can help with kind of noise in the, in the queries. Um, another challenge for ML system is handling rare and, and so-called out of vocabulary tokens. So because you have a learning system and it's learning from data, if it sees a word it's not encountered in its training data set, it doesn't know what to do with it. This isn't a problem in an inverted index because an inverted index is just matching tokens. And so if it sees a token and the token's in a document, it'll match it. It doesn't need to learn anything about it. All it's learning at index time is how frequent that token is. And if it's a really rare token, it'll give it a much higher weight. A normal model is almost the opposite. It doesn't, hasn't seen that token before. It doesn't know how to do it, how to do, uh, what to do with it. So there's various ways to handle this. Um, uh, so, I mean, one way this is handled, probably the most common way, which I'm not mentioning here, actually, is that you're training a pre-trained, you, you're pre-training an LLM on a massive amount of data. And so you're hoping that that data covers enough words that the model has some understanding of the word, even if you're fine-tuning on your own retrieval problem. If that fine-tuning doesn't cover those terms, you're hoping that the LLM itself does understand what that means. Um, but that still doesn't, often doesn't solve the problem because there's all sorts of industry jargon that won't be in, understood by a regular model, like that term Milwaukee from Home Depot. Like that, that's a brand for them, but most models aren't going to know that's a DIY brand. They're going to think that's a location. right? So, a lot of industries have these unique industry terms, and these models aren't going to be very good at matching them unless they've covered them extensively in a data set. So <clears throat> aside from the pre-training covering them, and it doesn't handle, doesn't typically handle um, proper nouns, and proper nouns is, is one of the biggest challenges for these systems for various reasons. Um, and you have other, some other ways to get around that. One way is, again, the subword tokenization scheme. So if that word has sober parts that are meaningful, um, then it can match on them, like garden versus gardeners versus gardening. Like it can match on the subword parts because they, they share a common meaning, and that's one way to solve it. Now, again, if you have a, a proper noun, like, I don't know, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Simon Hughes, like taking like the MON of my name, that doesn't mean anything. That has nothing to do with me, right? So you, in, and if you have a proper noun, uh, like breaking down a word into subword parts doesn't help you with the matching. It may help you with matching tokens if that token's in the index, but it doesn't help you understand the meaning of that word, and you'll probably get a lot of mismatches, a lot of false, false positives. Um, so that doesn't really help with that problem. Another way around this is hashing. So one thing you can do is if you have a word and it's not in your vocabulary, you hash it to a random, like using a hashing algorithm to hash it to a bucket, and that bucket gets um, a vector, and then you do search in that vector. So that allows you to basically mimic what a inverted index is doing, where it's just, even if it doesn't understand the meaning of the vector, it's still mapping it to a consistent representation that if that term is in the index, it will still retrieve it. Now, you can get hash collisions, but usually if you're searching for multiple words, the combination of those terms will, unlike, will likely resolve that ambiguity. And, and so hash collisions are less, less of an issue. And I have seen this be quite effective. We, did, we don't use this in Home Depot right now, but we did some experiments on it. It does work for certain types. Um, and you can find some details where Amazon are doing it in one of their, their papers there, which I linked in the, in the notes there. <clears throat> okay, um, so most betting retrieval models are some kind of, they're usually some form of Siamese neural network or two-tower neural network where you have uh, two encoders and, and you're basically trying to learn a common representation. Now, I probably should have mentioned the two-tower in here. I, I cut that out for brevity, but um, if you have a two-tower network where both towers are the same, it's a Siamese neural network, where each of these towers here are the same exact neural network, and it's just learning a common representation between a query and document. What you'll find in some systems is actually you have two, dif two different encoders, and that's not a Siamese network. That would be like a two-tower system 
where the query encoder may be different to the document encoder. They may have different features. Sometimes you have a lot more features about the document that aren't in the query. Or the query, you may have contextual features about the user. And so they, you want to have some kind of different representation. Um, I, either way, you'll have two towers. And then they're trying to learn an encoding. And then you're trying to maximize the similarity between similar things. And then minimize the similarity between dissimilar things or random things. Um, usually, you have a lot of positive examples. You may not have any negative examples. And so you may have to have ways to, to deal with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> Um, so how do you get the data to train these models? So if you're on an e-commerce site or you know, a public site where you have a clickstream, um, then most people are gathering clickstream data and using those user signals, those user events, to train the model, get training data for the model. Um, so this is obviously taken from Home Depot. But if the user searches, um, say I search for hammer, uh, Todd search, searches for Ryubi drill, Jane searches for, cheat, for freezer, the user sees some results, and then they take some action. Um, what we may say is, well, a purchase is a very strong positive signal, so we'll give that a label of 2. A click is a weak positive signal, we'll give that a 1. And then any document they skip over, so they see 20 results, they click on the 19th and the 5th. Everything else above that 19th that wasn't clicked on, we, we treat that as a skip. And that gets a negative way, because we assume that by skipping over that, it's an irrelevant result, at least in the eyes of that user. Um, so kind of using that simple scheme, we can derive labels to train our, our models. And how you assign these differences between the purchases and clicks is like as much an art as, as a science that can make a huge difference to your model. Usually you'll have a small number of purchases and a large number of clicks. So often just aggregating the clicks alone can build a better model and looking at the purchases. But the purchases are really what you want to optimize for. So it can be tricky. And then there's some. You may have some products that get clicked on a lot because they look pretty or for whatever reason, but people don't buy them. And so you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to figure out the right balance there. And it probably depends on users and the, and the categories you're in and so on. Um, but but in, by and large, you're using implicit data like this to, to train the system. You can't ask the users to rate everything, so you just use their behavior to, to train the models. <clears throat> um, so you use different types of positive signals, like so. And the, often that's, so aside from clicks, which are pretty universal, uh, your other types of po positive signal are often domain dependent, depending on what kind of site you have or type of application you have. <clears throat> so if you're e-commerce, it's going to be purchases. If you're a job site, it may be job applications. Um, if you're uh, YouTube or Spotify or me you know, media site, it may be media plays, media listens, something like that, um, in addition to clicks. <coughs> um, Getting negative labels, this is actually a much harder problem. So you may not have explicit negative signals. Uh, you can infer the, the skips, like I mentioned. Um, so skip documents are good ones to use as a proxy for negative labels. Um, obviously, people also mine negative, just, just look for random documents and, and treat those as negatives. And that's usually important to gain um, when training the system and to get a, a as a starting point, like you almost always want to do some kind of random sampling just to make sure the model understands this is different than that. Um, if all you do is, is is train on similar things, then that can also cause problems in these systems because they don't understand what is dissimilar. So first thing you need the model to learn about is this is not like this and this is like this. Um, but then you have to get into once you have a, have once the models learn those basic kind of um, meaning of the terms, then you have to get into hard negative mining, which is um, around sort of learning what is the difference between something that looks very similar but is subtly a negative versus something that's obviously a negative. It's, it's easy to find obvious negatives. It's very hard to find the hard negatives. And the hard negatives are what really improves the relevancy of the system. Um, so there's been a lot of research in the few, last few years about negative mining, hard negative mining. Um, <coughs> So I mean, and this is kind of illustrates it. So, you know, so the easy negatives that can be like I'm searching for dog and I get cats, right? So cat is a easy negative. It's nothing to do with dog. I'm going to randomly sample a bunch of documents, get some easy negative. Um, a soft negative will be something that's like eh, it's kind of close, but it's you know it's not. It's, it's still easy for the system to run. A hard negative is really where something's on the boundary of being a good positive, but it's still you know is not you know is a hard negative. And by learning those hard negatives. Those can produce the biggest kind of improvements to, to the system. Um, Home Depot, one of the things we did was just mined, rather than just 
randomly sampling documents, we sampled documents within the same category because they were close enough that you know they they were providing a lot more information to the system than just randomly matching a document to a query. Um, so you, you have to be very careful though, because if you mine hard negatives that are actually positives, then you end up breaking the system. So if someone's looking for a cordless circular saw, um, a good hard negative would be a corded circular saw because it's not cordless, um, so it's a negative. Um, but if you in, if your system mines like circular saw without cord as a hard negative, you're teaching the system the wrong thing because um, that's actually a positive. So then all the then you're going to actually hurt the the recall of the system because you're teaching it that is not similar and it is. So it, it's quite an easy to make to get this wrong and and to inadvertently mine positives as, as hard negatives. <coughs> um, so, I mean, it, roughly speaking, I would say there's two types of system. There's like content-based retrieval systems where you really you're looking at just the content of documents. And then there's those that are behavioral-based and they look at more user behavior. Um, if you've done recommendation systems and collaborative filtering would come into like behavioral-based where you're just looking at user's behavior. Um, usually what you want is a blend of these two. So you want a system that can look at the content and, and use that to provide a match, but also looks at how people actually search in the system. Um, if you have enough data, you can build a pretty good system on behavior that's only behavioral alone, but usually you want to have some blend of the two. Um, I'm going to skip over this next part. I just want to call out, especially if you're building an e-commerce platform, there's a very good library from Amazon, which is a very different way of thinking about search that does a pure behavioral kind of matching, where it's learning from a massive amount of data and saying that these are a set of queries. This is what you use this to click on or buy for those queries. And just using that behavioral data, you can get a very good system. And it's very different. It's not a neural model, although there are neural variants of this. Um, but that it's a different type of model that is useful to have in your system. In, in, in addition to like uh, content-based matching, if you augment your content-based matching with some behavioral-based matching, you'll see a big boost in your metrics, typically. Um, and you can read more about that on the paper there. Um, and then I think the last thing in this section I'll talk about is sort of search architectures. <coughs> so it's this kind of paradigm here, which is taken from a paper as Amazon, is becoming increasingly um, common where you have, uh, you, you still have the retrieval and ranking um, parts of the system, but usually you'll have now, you'll have multiple retrievers that are looking at different things. Um, and you'll take the results of those and then pass those, merge those together and pass them into one or more ranking steps. Um, so in the Amazon paper, they have, Elastical matching, which is basically just like elastic or whatever they're using instead of elastic search. Um, they have a neural model, which is yellow, which is doing like semantic matching because it understands the meaning of words. And then they have the extreme multi-label, which is understanding user behavior. And so they build a better system, but rather than just randomly like taking two of those or splicing them together, they take the combined set of the, all of those documents, merge them together into a matching set, and then pass that into a ranker. And that gives you a big diversity of search terms. So you're not only just catching the most common, commonly purchased items, you're catching the more relevant items. Um, and then you're, you're getting the, you know, the neural matches as well. <clears throat> and you'll see in this paper from Alibaba, which is um, the, the kind of Chinese uh, Amazon, um, also in Taobao, they're doing something. It's, it's basically the same type of design. Um, it's actually more complicated. They have three different um, retrieval systems. Again, they have an inverted index, a neural network, and some kind of behavioral-based system. It's more like a recommender system. They have a match set where they merge them all together, and then they have a very complicated ranker. This system is a nightmare <laughs> to optimize and scale, I'm sure, um, having built something similar but simplified. Um, but this is, yeah, m match, merge, and then re-rank is, is pretty common in the more complicated more sophisticated companies. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk where I just kind of give an overview of AI search. Uh, now I want to get into conversational search, which is looking at kind of how search is changing over the last year um, and how companies like Victoria are offering like in conversational search. <coughs> um, so you see uh, users' expectation of search has changed. So in 2022, we were happy with this, this cute, you know, the search box and a bunch of documents coming back. Now we want to have a full-blown conversation with our search engine. Um, 
but it's one big kind of snag to this, and that is model center makes stuff up. <laughs> right, so if it's not immediately obvious as a hand with six fingers. This is something our uh, CEO generated a few days ago from uh, Stable Diffusion, one of the older models. Uh, this particular quirk is fixed in the better image systems right now, but um, the, for a while there, they were really bad at getting fingers. They're still really bad at getting text. So if you ask uh, Dolly, even Dolly 3, I think, to generate something with a text sign in it, it will, the text is like gobbledygook usually. It looks like, like it's Arabic or something. I don't know. It, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's not in English or it's not in the language you ask it for. Um, and so that's a hallucination or confabulation, as some people like to, to, to use the term. Um, and often the models don't know what they don't know. So, you know, uh, GP, OpenAI have, have made big claims about how they have a multimodal system that understands images and text. So I asked it to generate an image of Kirby and Donkey Kong, and so it gave me this one. And that probably looks okay, reasonable, right? But Kirby doesn't have teeth, right? So and I didn't ask it for teeth. And then if you ask the same, like, the same system, at least, which is Bing Chat, which is OpenAI, and it covers, like, does Kirby have teeth? And it'll tell you confidently, no, it does not have teeth. But it'll give you this uh, image generation if you if you ask it to. Um, so another example, probably a more uh, well-known one, is the Galactica model, which was released. I want to say that was Meta. That was a model that was trained on scientific papers, uh, and then I think Meta or whoever released it made some big claims about it, um, and then they actually, I think they they removed it a few weeks later because people found it was hallucinating all sorts of research that didn't exist. Um, like there is citing some some paper that never was never never existed, never was written by those authors. They're probably real authors, and that's probably a, a topic. But it, that paper never never existed. Um, and it, a lot of the hallucinations where it's, it's off by a little bit. So I was trying to get GPT four is pretty good, but it is still hallucinate from time to time. I was trying to get it see if I can get it to hallucinate. Um, and so I asked it, you know, being English, uh, I said, who is the president of the UK? It, obviously, I know there's no president of the UK, but I was trying to trick it. Who's the president of the UK in 1840? And so it correctly surmised there are no presidents of the UK, so I'll give you the prime minister. Um, and then it'll say, well, from 1840, uh, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of 1840, it was Robert Peel. Well, according to Wikipedia, he didn't come into power until 1841. So it was close, but it was off by a year. Um, so... Uh, so why do models hallucinate? I mean, no one truly, I think, understands the exact reason for this. The, the common theory, and I think this is actually probably not, 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 as, not really correct in most cases. It obviously isn't some. Uh, but the most, the most common um, claim is that people say, well, it's picking up the information online that's wrong. Uh, I would actually say I don't think it's doing that. It's actually um, it's a data compression thing. Um, so this is great quote from this New Yorker article that came out at the start of the year, chat GPT is a blurry JPEG of the web. So if you're trying to compress a mass, like the entirety of the internet into uh, trillion parameters or whatever GPT-4 is, they won't say. GPT-3 was 1.175 billion, I think. Uh, if you're trying to compress all that information into, granted it's a big amount of data, but it's still, it's, it's, it's compression. So if you look at these models and they hallucinate, I spent all the time doing this lately, what they do is they'll, they'll fill in the blanks, which is what they're trying to do, with things that look like they make sense, um, and that, that look like the kind of things you'll find in the same context. But because it's not trained to verify facts, it's just trained to fill in the blank with the most plausible thing, um, you know, that, that's, that's where the hallucination comes from. It, it finds things that are related and look plausible, but aren't factually correct. Kind of like, I say it's kind of like my, um, my father-in-law. He's a retired history teacher. He has a really good wealth of knowledge, but you ask him on something, he'll never tell you, he doesn't know the answer. He'll, he'll say something he thinks is right, and he'll fact check it, and no, that's not quite right, <laughs> Michael, and then he gets frustrated. So, so and it's kind of what they think they're doing, is it's like a data compression issue. They're really trying to compress the data and do slot filling, um, and, and that's where it comes from. Um, some other things, so they can't differentiate between like a high quality source like the New York Times and a low quality source like, I don't know, Reddit or um, or Twitter or someone's opinion on your social network, which may be wrong or biased in some way. Um, they also probably come across some facts where they have conflicting information, and so the model doesn't really know or have any mechanism to try to resolve those conflicts by doing any kind of reasoning. It's just learning 
well, what is the most common response to this question, even if it's wrong? Um, and again, they're trained for slot filling. So they're really, they're very, the president of online at Home Depot said, wow, it's really good, like, it's a very confident bullshitter, I think is what he said. I think he used a more correct term, but it's, it's like it's very confident when it's wrong. Like it's, these models are like confidently tell you things that are, it, it does not know. Um, <clears throat> so how are people using these models? Well, really what they're using these models, yeah, they're using them for generation, which is a different, like if, it's, if you're asking it to write a poem, you don't care so much if it's accurate, as long as it's not making stuff up that's completely implausible. Um, so if people are using it for generation purposes, it's not a problem, but most, most people are using it as a search engine or as a knowledge source. Um, and so that's where hallucination really becomes an issue. Um, you know, so a big focus of our business and a lot of companies is really trying to apply it to search. And when it's a search use case, we're really using it as a question answering system. So in the literature, there's really two types of QA systems. There's what's called a closed book QA system and an open book QA system. So a closed book QA system is when you go on chat GPT and it's not hitting the internet. You ask it a question, it, it consults this massive amount of information, and it tells you some answer. Um, it's a closed book because there's no source information that it's referring to. An open book system is like an open book test. You go in a test, you take in your textbook, you're allowed to consult the textbook when answering. So the open book system has some kind of knowledge base. Usually it's a search engine and, and a document store. It has a retriever, often a re-rank or two. It goes, it queries a database, it pulls back related information, and then it summarizes that information. It's, it's a, they call it a reader-retriever paradigm, I think. You, know, re you retrieve documents, and then you read the results, and then you answer the question. Um, so the problems with closed book systems versus open book systems, right? So the model is prone to hallucinate as there's no way to validate the sources. Um, the model is out of date as soon as it's trained because it, it's fixed in time, right? You can do fine tuning, but fine tuning is very slow and it's not a good way to get new information to the system. And neural networks are still notorious for catastrophic forgetting. If you stuff new information in there, often it forgets what it's already learned. Uh, there's this, there's this, so if you trained it, you know, understand medical stuff, all of a sudden you want to train it on, I don't know, veterinary stuff, it'll forget a lot of the medical stuff it's already learned. Um, there's no way to control access to the information, so if it's just stored in, okay. Uh, if it's just stored in the connection weights, then you can't control what information is accessible by what people. And so there's a fa famous case where ChatGPT um, started leaking information, sensitive information. There's no way to really prevent that. In these systems, maybe you can put some kind of classifier in front of it, but there's not an easy way to control that. Um, and if you want to acquire domain specific knowledge that's not in the system, you have to retrain it or fine tune it further. If you have an open book system that's powered by a search engine, uh, you do solve a lot of those problems. You have a system that's actually often more accurate at question answering. Um, some research has shown that it actually not just, not just has a lot of the benefits, but actually better at answering questions. Um, first of all, as long as you have a good retrieval system. Um, you have sources retrieved the answer, so you can verify them yourself. Uh, you don't have to just trust the model word for it. Um, it forces a by forcing the model to ground its response in, in sources, that's been shown to reduce hallucinations in a lot of papers. Um, you can control who has access to data and what data is there. So if you don't want some set of users to access some information, you just don't search those documents, period. Maybe they don't get an answer back, but then the system should tell you, well, we can't find any, any results. Um, if you want to adapt it to a new domain, you just run it on a different corpus. You may need to do some fine tuning, potentially, but you don't have to retrain it with every single document in that corpus. You just have, you just have to know, it just has to know how to summarize information in that corpus. Um, Yeah, and so getting, in, and getting new information is just as simple as adding new documents to your search system. So it can always have up-to-date information. So this is why you'll quickly see, like, when ChatGPT came out, Bing didn't go and integrate ChatGPT. They integrated it with their search. So when you use Microsoft's chat system, you're not chatting just with OpenAI. You're, you're chatting with their Bing search, and then OpenAI is summarizing the results for you, which is known as RAG, Retrieval Augmented uh, Generation. And so it's, it's very critical that if you have a system like that, it's very good at summarizing information. Um, so one of the things, the main thing I've been working on since I moved to Victoria was a way to detect hallucinations. Um, so there's a lot of 
ideas around how to do this. A lot of the work is based on that of recognizing textual entailment, uh, which is an older NLP topic where you have um, this kind of information. So you have a premise and a hypothesis, and it gets three labels. Does the hypothesis, can it be entailed from the premise, meaning does it logically follow on? Uh, are they neutral, meaning there's not really anything to do with one another, or do they contradict? Do they provide information that does not align with the original information? So a lot of the models for detecting hallucinations build off of those NLI models, those RTE models, um, and then add a lot of specific data sets around summarization and, and, and uh, abstracted summarization to try and fine tune those models for uh, hallucination detection. Um, so we did some work on this. Um, oh, these are some of the key papers. Excuse me. There's really two main data sets that people refer to, the SUMAC data set and the TRUE data set, which are referenced in those papers. And I would say these are some of the best models in the, in the academic literature for solving these problems. Uh, we trained our own model. We took the data sets referenced in those papers along with the evaluations that we recommended and trained a model to try to outperform that across the different benchmarks. Um, and we have sort of what I think is one of the most accurate models across the SUMAC and um, true data sets in terms of detecting uh, summarization, ac uh, summarization accuracy. So what we do is, we, something like those recommend RT uh, examples, we have a document, it can be a one sentence, it could be 50. We have a summary, and then we try to, we have a classifier that's an LLM, a small LLM, and it says, well, is, is this hallucinating or not? Um, and so by training a specific model, you know, training a specific LLM for that task, we hoped, you know, we, we think it, it should outperform these more general purpose models. We open source that model on Hugging Face. You can download it now. Just use their uh, open source library. It's free for commercial use, um, which a lot of the other ones are not. And we have a blog about it there. Um, so using that, we, tr we came up with an LLM, le LLM leaderboard based on the top LLMs out there um, and how often they hallucinate according to our model. Now this is model derived, so these aren't, no model is perfectly accurate, but it's, it's correlated enough with humans that I think, although the numbers may be slightly off from what a human would give it, I think the overall ranking is reasonably close to what you would see from a person. And our goal is to maintain this, like update it monthly. So rather than having a group of raters do this once and then forget about it, we want to create a model and then we can update this, new models come out, they change GPT-4, GPT-5, Palm-3, whatever. We can score it against this model, and then we'll continue to develop this model as well and, and maintain this over time. Um, so you can check it out there. We still find the OpenAI models are the best today, and Llama models are close behind. Some of the other models, like Google's, are particularly bad at hallucinating in the context of summarization. And so summarization is what you want for a rag system, so we focus on that, that area. Oops. Uh, we also were featured this week in the New York Times. Um, they, they wrote an article about uh, the work that we've been doing. So we were lucky enough to, to get some press from that. And we have some other reporters I'm talking to as well. Um, so you can go read that article if you're interested. Or if you, if you can't find it because it's paywalled, I can send you the link that's not paywalled if you want to read it. Um, written by a guy called Cabe, uh, Cabe Metz who wrote a book. Um, by AI that was, that was quite uh, popular. Um, and then just finally, just to give some examples of some hallucinations that we detected with a model. Um, so this is the one that's mentioned in the article. This is probably easiest to explain. So the Palms chat model, which is, we use their API. Uh, we give it a source, which is a sh short newspaper article about some plants that were found in the UK. Uh, a piece in, in an elaborate grow house. A man in the 40s was arrested at the scene. When asked to summarize that, um, Palm Chat, which is a chat bison model, added that they were cannabis plants, which is a reasonable assumption, but is not stated in the source. And worse than that, it, it gave a street value, which is not <laughs> at all mentioned in the source, and who knows if that's correct. Right, so it just added that in there. Really cool. Because if you're reading a lot of papers, it will talk about the street value. Usually, usually when they talk about these things, it mentioned the street value. That wasn't mentioned in the article. Maybe they didn't have it. But uh, you know, so that was that in there. There's another one here from Cohere. I won't get into that one. Um, so next steps, um, we plan to add this model into our platform and give us a sort of reliability score 
uh, for every, every summary we provide that's not there yet, we wanted to release the model first. Everyone else can use it, uh, get it out there, and then we'll add it into the platform in the next few months. Um, we want to add, so one thing we've seen is these models will miss site sources sometimes. So we don't often see complaints about hallucinations in it because those are you know, better in the RAG system and we're using GPT-4, which is one of the best out there. But what we see more often is it misciting sources. So we'll get used to saying, well, it's, it's quoting this source, but when you look in this document, it doesn't mention that, that topic at all. So the next thing we want to do is measure citation accuracy using the same, same approach. So we have, I have some people working on that. Um, and then we're going to build our own summarization model, ideally, that hopefully has an even better or lower hallucination rate. Because um, you don't really, so to do hallucination, like using a trillion, trillion parameter LLM is probably like, like shooting a weevil with a shotgun. Like it's, like if you need, need summarization, you don't actually want a model to know everything there is in the world. You just need it to be a good summarizer information. So um, like if I have someone that can just read English and understand it, they don't have to be like, um, you know, winning Jeopardy to do that, right? They just need to be able to read English. Um, so we think that just having actually having a simple model that's a good summarizer and specifically targeting RAG will actually be better than, than using these LLMs, which were trained for something very different, um, and, and using them as a summarizer model. Um, so that's where we're going from there. All right, that is, that is it. That's the talk. So thank you. <coughs> I go, oh.